But we're still locked down. We can't get to our boats. You can't, I can't, none of us can. Very frustrating. But at least we can think about it and we can think about what we do. We can reminisce. We can swing the lamp a bit and, uh, and have some fun. And this morning, I'm going to talk about the paper logbook. Sounds like a boring subject, doesn't it? But it isn't. It's actually increasing in importance as we rely more and more on electronic navigation. But I'm going to start by showing you the cover of my first ever ocean-going logbook. And here it is. This cover, it's, well, you can see it's been battered by time. It's been knocked about by deck leaks and goodness knows what else. But there it is. It's an old book, 10 by 8, that uh, my wife found somewhere. But my early logbooks are sort of half logbook, half diary, really. And this is this one. I love this cover. It's an advertisement that I cut out of an old copy of Yachting Monthly back in 1974. And as you can see, it was an advertisement for PIMS. And the picture, which you can hardly see now, I actually have a, a, a copy of that up on my dining room wall. And it's a picture of Charles Nicholson steering Candida in a big class race in the 1930s. The yacht you can see to leeward under the end of the boom, the big black boat, that is Britannia herself, steered probably by King George V, or if not him, then by his sailing master Sir Philip Hunlock, thundering up under the lee as these great yachts hammer down the Solent. What a grand, inspiring shot that was. And it always tickled me. There's nothing like a pins at a time like this. And uh, last week I was telling you about a storm I was in. Well, this is the log book we had at that time. And uh, <laughs> there's nothing like a pins at a time like this when you're on your knees at the bottom of the companionway praying for deliverance to your maker. So there it is. But what's inside it is interesting. The entries are really very simple in those days in navigational terms. Remember... Most of these entries were made on an ocean passage. We're actually bound south into the South Atlantic when this particular page was done. You can see it here. We've got uh, the top, we've got a good position. Uh, that's an astro position. And I've simply written down latitude and longitude, which is really all we needed. That will be transferred to the North Atlantic chart. And that's it for the navigation, really, until 24 hours time. If you read on, you can see that there's quite a lot of commentary there about what we've been having for dinner, because really, you know, what we ate was, was a big part of the day. Sometimes I would enter what I'd been reading about, or one thing or another, and further on down the page, you'll see that there's a, an entry about the accuracy of the timepiece. Somehow we've managed, we're nearly at the equator here, we're at two degrees north and we're, we're uh, somewhere off the bulge of Africa, heading down and we're desperate for a time check because I'm using the Smith's electric clock that I bought in a hardware shop. That was my chronometer in those days and they were pretty good. And if you look at this, you'll see I've found a, I've found a time check. It looks as if I got it from Russia. And uh, down on the side there of the page, it says that the time check was 17 minutes out. So, I'm sorry, 17 seconds out. And it was bang on because that was the rate that I'd given the clock. I expected it to be 17 seconds out, and it was, which meant that my astro navigation could be pinpoint accurate, because remember that anywhere near the equator, four seconds of inaccuracy in your timepiece means a mile adrift in your position. So you've got to watch out for that. So it's all there in the old logbook. Lovely, isn't it? Now, our landfall with this book was in northern Brazil, a place called Salvador, which is just south of the equator. When we got there, we were greeted by the master of the port, the captain of the port himself, who was a, a fully qualified naval officer with brass bound and scrambled egg on his hat, and he came out in a launch. And he came out and he had a girl with him. And the girl had brought a great big plate full of canapes. And he had a jug of rum punch. And he came over the rail. Uh, and I said, oh, I'm, I'm here to clear customs, sir. And he said, well, that's quite all right. He said, don't worry about that. Let's have a drink first. And he told us that this particular day was the anniversary of, I think, the birth or the arrival or something of Lord Cochrane, who had fallen foul of the British authorities. He was a naval officer, of, a proper frigate captain, who'd done great things during the Napoleonic Wars. But he didn't get on with the authorities and something had happened and he'd left. And he'd come down to South America 
to, in search of adventure, and he became their first admiral when they were fighting for independence from Spain and Portugal, these countries, back in those days. And they've never forgotten. And so the captain of the port, he gave me some flowers. He handed them to my wife, and, 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 and he gave me this little card, which has got his, 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 his name on the bottom, and, and it says, on the day of tomorrow, we do commemorate the second century of Lord Cochrane's birth, who fought for the Brazilian independence, and we have the honour of having his personality as our first line admiral. These flowers represent our sympathy to a Great Britain's lady. And that was to Ros. And, and he handed over the flowers and we all had a party. That's the way to clear in, isn't it? None of this black gang rummaging you for drugs that you don't have and wouldn't even look at. No, what a fun thing. But you see, I've put it all in the logbook. And that's what you should do. If you have a logbook that's not ruled up with loads of columns, you can do this sort of thing. And when we get somewhere with our logbooks, which are never ruled up unless I rule them myself, I rule up what I need, nothing else. And when we arrive somewhere, the logbook becomes our visitor's book, which is brilliant because it means that we always remember where we met somebody. And as we look back on the logbooks 20, 30, 40 years later, we can remember, do you remember old Charlie? Goodness me, he could put it away, couldn't he? Or that fella who crossed the Atlantic and he never had a chronometer and he did it all on latitude and he found Barbados anyway. Yeah, you can do all that. So it's a good trick not to buy a ruled up logbook. Buy one with blank pages and put the ruled in columns that you want. Now here is what my modern logbook looks like. You'll see that it's an A4 book now and uh, I've got columns ruled on the left hand side and on the right hand page I write my comments and it's all here. You can see if you look at the columns we've got time, Barometer. Terribly important that. You've got to keep a, a log of the barometer, otherwise you don't want to happen, know what's happening to the weather. We've got the weather column next, which tells us what the wind's doing, and if it's raining it'll tell us that. Uh, we've got course over the ground and speed over the ground. Notice this is a modern log book. I haven't got course steered and, 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 uh, and log distance anymore. I, I, I'm taking it off my GPS. This is quite important because if the GPS goes down, which is what the log book's all about, I want to know the most accurate course I've been steering and uh, the most accurate distance run. And really, if I'm taking them off the GPS, they're probably more accurate than what I'm getting off my own personal in-boat instruments, the, the trailing log or the, the log that's running on the paddle under the boat, uh, and the compass. It's arguable that you should run those two as well. And I suppose if I was being strictly accurate according to Crocker, that's what I'd do. But the fact of the matter is that if my GPS goes down, the very worst position I'll be in is that it'll be an hour since I had a log entry, because I'm entering it most times on the hour. I can look back and I can see where I was an hour ago. I can see what course I was steering. I can see what speed I was making. If I slowed down, I can make some sensible adjustment. And with that, I can plot an estimated position, because as we look at the logbook, we can see that uh, the next column is position. Sometimes it's just got a lat long, but very often I prefer to put a course, uh, a rather a range and bearing to a known, a known object. Uh, the reason for that is that it's a lot easier to plot a position with just a single, a single bearing on a plotter, on a, on, a, on a chart protractor and a pair of dividers than it is to start scratching around trying to plot an accurate lat long position. So if I'm doing my position, I try to put range and bearing to a known object. Um, the last two columns on this column page are the generator, uh, which hasn't been on at all today, um, probably because my engine's been on a fair amount. Yeah, um, I put my revs down there and when it goes on and when it goes off. On the right hand page is my comments. Well, these might be past so-and-so cardinal boy, and we can relate it to the time. But it might also be had a jolly good dinner, or sat and had a sundowner reminiscing about that dreadful man we met in the last port we were in. Dear me, how do we put up with him? And we all have a bit of a laugh about that, and we'll put it down in the logbook, and then we'll remember it. It's nice to do that. You put your navigational stuff down, but you put a few comments in as well, so it becomes a diary. And that's really the way to run a logbook. The vital thing about it is that it's got the position, course steered and distance run, 
and from that, and the time of course, and from that we can work up an estimated position straight away on a paper chart if all our electronics go fut. A classic example of the importance of the paper logbook uh, came to me one time when I was coming into the Solent on a huge container ship. I was with the pilot. Massive great ship. Uh, the bridge was bigger than my house and on that bridge uh, there was complete control of all this technology. It was the captain sitting in an armchair watching what was going on. There was a mate on watch. There was a chap from the Far East steering. He had a great big numerical compass in front of him that measured the course to half a degree. Marvellous, isn't it? But in the corner of the bridge was the third mate, the young fella, and he had a pad in his hand, a paper pad and a pencil, and he was writing down everything that happened, and he was writing the positions down in pencil on a piece of paper on this high-tech container ship so that if everything failed, they would know where they were. And that is the secret of the logbook. I'm just going to finish up by showing you my chart table. Here it is. You'll see that we've got uh, a proper modern chart plotter on the bulkhead there. We've got my PC, which is running raster charts. We've got a few jolly things pinned up on the bulkhead to keep me laughing. I've got Lord Nelson keeping an eye on things. I've got a clock. I've got a barometer. And on the right-hand side on the table, you will see my paper logbook. It's open and it's up to date. So that if all those magic chattering machines go dumb, I just open the chart table, pull out my chart, and carry on as I've always done. Nothing lost. Paper logbook is the most important safety feature you've got. Some people say it's even more important than the life raft. <laughs>